this morning we thank the Lord as you mean standing just took the Bible to the book of Genesis chapter 12 if you could just stand for the reading of the word will do not be too long we just want to read a couple of scripture taken from Genesis chapter 12 When you have it, would you say amen this morning? The book of Genesis chapter 12, we want to read from verse 1 to verse 4. And then we will have our seat. Now the Lord said to Abram, Grow from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. So that you will be a blessing and i will bless those who will bless you and him who dishonor you i will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed so abram went as the lord had told him and lot went with him want well, to thank god for the reading of his word this morning which is already blessed turn to your neighbor and say neighbor i gotta get a lot out of my life you may have your seat this morning and as you do put your hands together for the Holy Spirit for the Lord this morning I want to share with you this morning from what we have read this morning I want to speak to you from a topic that you got to get a lot out of your life you got to get a lot out of your life when I read an account of scripture in this book, in the book of Genesis, there was a, a, a prophetic declaration that was made to Abraham. And before that, he, his name was changed to Abraham. He was Abram. And God gave him a prophetic word. There was a prophetic declaration that was, was declared to his life. And if we have read this prophetic declaration that the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to a land that I will show you. And he says, I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be, be a blessing. He is not making his name great just for himself, but he is making his name great so that he can be a blessing. And he says, I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonor you, I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so we declare verse 4 is where we want to really home in in what I want to share this morning. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. And I was studying this passage of scripture in the wee hours of the morning. And the Lord impressed upon my heart this morning because there's a big trouble with a little lot in our lives. I want you to know that true freedom is found only when we fully yield ourselves to Christ. Some people have not fully yielded themselves to Christ. That's why they're still experiencing some bondage. That's why they're still experiencing, amen, they feel tied on. They feel nothing is working for them. Are you hearing me? They're doing everything possible, but they are not seeing or getting the breakthrough because why? 
when they take an introspect or if we take an introspect into our life, if we are fully um, not, you know, fully um, surrendered our life to Christ, we will not have true freedom. Are you following me? Anybody who have truly and fully surrendered their life to Christ is really going to be a person who is free. Are you hearing me? You'll be surprised today that how many Christians are still in bondage. You know, I was crying out to the Lord because there were so many things to do. So less time to do it. And then there is the work of the enemy. The warfare that we all are engaged in. And, you know, it's easy just to go by how you feel at the moment. But then not every time that you can go by your feeling because your feeling can lead you wrong. But you got to go by what the Word of God is saying. Now I'm trying to get to a point here this morning because I want to look into your life this morning and, and to understand some valuable truths as we walk on this journey, on this path. Because we all want to experience this true freedom that Jesus has declared. How many of you desire that true freedom? That there is no weight upon your life. You feel there is no oppression. Even though that you will face trials and testing, you know that God is on your side. But if you are a believer and you feel frustrated and you feel oppressed and you feel that God is not on your side, you got to take an introspect into your life and truly see if you have surrendered all to God. Because if you surrender all to God and you fully surrender your life to God, that means you're not going to hold back anything from God. Not your time, not your money, nothing. Not your giftings, nothing. Because everything that you see that you have, it is from the perspective that you will recognize that God has just um, placed you as a steward towards the things that he has given to you. So you actually don't own it. Your money is not yours. It belongs to God. Your house is not yours. Are you following me? We have to have this mindset that nothing on this earth is belong to us. Because when you die, you cannot take it. Are you following me? You cannot take it. But we have to be good stewards to what God has given to us. And so therefore, this morning, I want to interject some thoughts as we go through this passage of Scripture to help us to understand how we can come to that place to truly be free in our life. God informed Abram of his plan to bless him and to make him a blessing. And one, one necessary condition for receiving I mean, God's best is for, to have a full surrendered life unto Him. Every aspect of our being, our body, our soul, and our spirit must be surrendered to Almighty God. Are you hearing me this morning? God has also informed us of His desire to bless us. How many know that God wants to bless you? God says in, in, in the book of First John, I believe it's in chapter 5, it tells us, you know, he was declaring, the word has been declared to us that God desired that we prosper and we be in good health, but as our as soul prosper it. And so therefore we get this notion and throughout the scripture, we believe that God desired to bless his people. How many believe truly that God desired to bless us this morning? And so God has informed us and interject scripture because I want you to know, amen, God is not a man that he should lie. What he have declared, that will come to pass. And so we could hold to the word of God because if God declares that he want to bless you, he's not going to change his mind. That's why I continually to say and declare God don't have to look at your past to determine how you live your life in order to bless you. Are you hearing me? Because if God were to look back at our past, we all have messed up big time. But God do not consult our past to determine how he's going to bless us. God desired to bless every one of us here this morning. Are you hearing me? That's why he has chosen you. That's why the preacher preached the message and you adhere to the word of God. It stood your spirit and the day that you walk up to the altar or you give your life to Jesus, amen. He has chosen you as a son or daughter in order that you could become part of the family and so that he could bless you. Are you following me? 
And so we see in a bigger context when we watch in this passage of scripture, even though we read the story of Abraham, we are looking at God calling out an individual from among an a, a, a ungodly environment and give him a word, a promise that is going to change his life. And not only going to change his life, Abraham is going to become Abraham, the father of all nations. And here it is that he's going to be a blessing to humanity. Are you hearing me? Even in the book of Galatians, it tells us that those who are in Christ Jesus are blessed with the same blessings of Abraham. Because we have become spiritual seeds of Abraham. Are you following me? And so God desired to bless you and I. And so therefore we look into the scripture this morning that God begins to lay down the condition for Abram to become the blessed man of purpose and promise. Are you hearing me? Even though that God desire to bless you and I, I want you to know there is a certain condition that must be followed in order to receive the blessings of God. Are you hearing me? Because if there was no condition in order to get the blessing, I want you to know everybody is going to be blessed. In fact, I would say in part, if we will look at it from the perspective, even the godly is being blessed. Because the rain falls, the sun shines on the, on, the, on the good and the bad, on the, on the saved and the unsaved. Are you hearing me? And it is because of God's goodness. But when you become a son and daughter of the kingdom of God, God amen, wants to bless you. And when I talk about the word bless, I'm not just talking about a dollar sign. Are you following me? Blessing in the whole capacity that, and the money is just part of it. Are you hearing me? But good health, good marriage. Are you hearing me? Good family. Amen. And a good job. Are you hearing me? A wonderful spirit. Amen that the attributes or the fruit of the Spirit will be demonstrated or mature from your life. And so God wants to use us and He wants to bless us, but there is condition in order to receive the blessings of God. Are you following me? So here He's saying, and we, we ought to understand this this morning as we go along. He says, He must leave His country and His kindred, His relatives, that means in His father and His father's house. He must follow with no knowledge of where He is going. So if you're going to believe God, amen, you just can't look at the out, take an outlook. You've got to adhere to what God is saying. Sometimes we don't understand how God is leading because we can't comprehend the direction. But as a child of God, we just got to have faith and to believe, amen, if God says to go left, then go left. If God says to go right, then go right. Amen. We are not here. Amen. We can question God, but God wants you to just trust Him. Don't try to figure Him out. Don't try to understand everything. Everything. Just trust him as he's leading this morning. Are you following me this morning? And so he must follow, Abraham must follow with no knowledge of where he is going. Let me say this in a profound statement that I, I want to declare this morning. There's a place in life that are waiting your arrival and are prepared for you before you ever get there. And so therefore there's a place in God that has been already prepared for you but you haven't arrived as yet. Are you following me? It is already prepared for you. And it is awaiting your arrival. And I'm not talking about heaven. Are you hearing me? Because the first concept you might think it's heaven. I'm not talking about heaven. Because the Bible tells us when we read in the, in the Gospels, in the Beatitude, it says the meek shall inherit the earth. Are you hearing me? And so there is something, there's a place in God has prepared for you. And it is awaiting your arrival. You may not be able to enjoy all the benefits that is in that place because you are not there as yet. And it's not because of God's fault that you're not there. Sometimes because of the decisions that we make in our life, we hold back, amen, ourselves from getting to the assigned place that God has prepared for His people. Follow me this morning. And so the Bible tells us that Abraham was surrounded by an ungodly system of idolatry. Abram out of the polytheistic um, systems of, of many gods. And so therefore, we got to understand something very closely because those who was in, 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 the, in the land of the Chaldeans were worshipping many gods. Are you hearing me? And so I want you to see the concept, amen, in a bigger picture what God is doing. God has saved us and he's called us to himself. 
before you and I, there were many gods that we were serving. We, we, some may be idols, amen. Some could be your money, some could be your house, some could be your career, amen. But God is calling us out from all of serving all of these many gods to serve the true and living God. Are you following me? So we look at this from the perspective of salvation, from a broader perspective. And that's what God is doing to all of us because He's a jealous God. And you should not serve no, no other God but Him. Are you hearing me? And so we see here, God called Abram out of a nation, amen, that served many God. God will never be satisfied to be among the gods of your life. Follow me this morning. God will never be satisfied to be among the gods, not God, the gods of, of many lives. Those who follow God must follow the example of Abram and renounce and dethrone every rival and crown Christ alone as Lord and as God. Are you following me? Because when Abram adhered to the voice of the Lord, what did Abram do? The scripture never gave an indication that he disobeyed God and he put off the voice. We have seen that Abram, when God spoke into his life, Abram responded. Are you hearing me? Like many of us, amen, we had other religious beliefs and practices. But when we come, amen, and Jesus speak into our lives, amen, by the Holy Spirit, amen, we adhere to his voice and we make, amen, that confession that we're going to dethrone every other God from our life and make Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. How many of you meet with me this morning? We're going somewhere. What does a surrendered life entail? Let me break this down for you. A surrendered life entails or it involves complete commitment to Christ. That's what a surrendered life means. A complete commitment to Christ, unaltered by worldly influence. Does that sound familiar this morning? Because there are many believers are hindered by worldly influence. Even people who go to church are hindered by worldly influence. But a surrendered life entails that we are completely committed to Christ. That's why if we were put in a category, what position or what priority God holds on your list? God should always be number one. How many believe that? But there are people who have God low down on their chat. Maybe he's the last person on your priority list. Because, take for example, we will do everything else but worship God or seek God when we get up in the morning. Because we are busy. And we have doing everything else to get on our job and so forth. God knows you have to work. But where does our priority lie? Who is number one? And so therefore you could see and tell, amen, where God is on our priority list by how we live our life. He should be number one on the agenda this morning. Because it tells when he's number one, we are completely committed to Christ. Many of God's people this morning, today are trying to serve God as one of many. What I'm saying, you want God, but you worship your career. You worship your house. You worship your TV. I'm just trying to break it down. The thing that you spend most of their time with. Followed me this morning. You are trying to fit God. Many, that is, is trying to fit God into a comfortable time slot. I want you to think for that for a moment. Many people today is trying to fit God into a comfortable time slot where people worship all kinds of gods. Now first you would say, Pastor, that, that don't mean me. But we get in somewhere. There are those who worship the God of convenience. 
convenient. You know, like some people conveniently use you. Or they conveniently is your friend. You can understand that aspect. In the same token, there are many who fit God into a comfortable time slot and they worship God as a God of convenience. I have spoken to many people in my time as being a pastor. And even when we look at the statistics, you will see that every year millions of unborn babies are slain on the altar of pro-choice offered up to the God of convenience. Because people engage in sexual activity, get pregnant, and here it is, you don't want the baby. Convenience. You're going somewhere. People worship the God of materialism, wealth, and therefore that turns into greed. Because why? We want all the fine things that money can buy at the expense this morning that our spiritual life is decaying. As I shared on Friday night, the altar of our life is not teared down by the terrorists in Pakistan or Afghanistan. The, the altars in our life are teared down by neglect and rejection. Are you following me this morning? And when we have a people who altar are rejected and neglected, you will have a people who are giving to the fancies of this world. Will give in to the convenience of this world. Are you following me this morning? What about the God of popularity? Many are going after that because I want to be popular. I want to add a title to my name. The God of popularity. That's why you can see it in the world. Everybody wants to be popular. Are you hear me? The God of popularity. What about the God of personal fitness? You have people, nothing wrong with, with exercising. Nothing wrong with taking care of your body. But there are people, amen, worship that type of aspect. Hear me now. They will do everything to just to have, amen, the greatest physical body. Just because they want it. But because it brings fame to them. Are you following me? The God of personal fitness. In other words, creature worship. That's what it is. Creature worship. And then, the worship, the God of creation. I mean, re recreation that is. You'd be surprised on a Sunday, how many people will leave our church for recreation. I'm just trying to be real this morning. How many people will give up the, the Lord's day to do something that is, is not really important? If you have to work, you have to work. If something that is very important, fine. But for, for things that is unnecessary, they prefer to leave out the Lord's day. We're going somewhere. I'm preaching different today, right? Sunday after Sunday, multitude of people worship the God of recreation. And the altar of God is left empty and alone. Like Nebuchadnezzar in the scripture, who designed and set up an image of himself to be worshipped as God. And a lot of people we are seen are doing that. Multitude of people in our churches is doing the same thing this morning. They have designed in their imagination the kind of God they want. People have a preference to the God that they want. They want a God of love. They want a God, amen, who will bless them. They want a God, amen, that don't want anything from them. Follow me this morning. We're getting somewhere. They want their own type of God. If you give them a paper and a pen and tell them to draw the type of God they want, you will see that they will draw or want a God to fit their convenience. They worship the God of their own creation. And they call it the God of heaven. Their God puts sports above the work of God. 
He doesn't mind. This God of convenience doesn't mind if an individual, they go on a Saturday night and they gamble all night, all night Saturday and come to church Sunday morning and pay their tithes and give up the offering. That God of convenience don't mind you doing that. God of convenience don't mind that you go on club all night on Saturday. As long as you could just go to church and just feel a good spirit and leave, nothing change. He's not asking you to do anything. Are you getting my point this morning? We're getting somewhere. Follow with me. You can do everything else. Their God never chastised or disciplined them. This God of convenience, He never hurts their pride or requires humility or submission. But the God that we serve desire that we submit. And the God that we serve desire that we surrender. The God that we serve desire that He be number one in our lives. But many a times we don't want this God because this God wants too much for our life and it's hard to give up all of these other areas. So therefore we want a God of convenience. Follow me this morning. And best of all, your God doesn't interfere with you. Think about it. So in other words, you're saying, the, the God that you, the God of convenience is just sitting on a shelf and just waiting for you to have a problem. And you can take him on from the shelf and rub your belly and confess when you're going sure and boop when it's gone, you put him back on the shelf. Like nothing happened. But hear me now this morning as we get into the text because I want you to see something this morning from what I'm sharing. God called Abram to come out of a hostile environment. From an environment of conveniently, of convenience. An environment where they serve, amen, many force God. And he's calling them out of this type of hostile environment. Not necessary hostile to Abram, but to the call and the operations of God's spirit in his life. Followed me. Because when God calls you, he calls you out. In fact, the church is the ecclesia, the called out ones. Are you hearing me? God is calling, out, calling us out of something. Are you hearing me? I mean, not necessary calling us out of the world. Because the Bible says we are in this world, but we are not of this world. So it means to say... Necessary that we can't function in this world, but what he's calling us out from the systems and the programs, amen, and, and the environment, amen, the negative environment that will affect our spiritual walk. So some or many are in an environment right now that are hostile to the anointing of God that is in your life. Many people are in that type of environment. Because instead of it building up your faith, it is pulling down your faith. I'm going somewhere this morning. Hallelujah. Every time you get around certain people, and I'll use people as an example. Every time you get around certain people, they leave you feeling drained, they leave you feeling dry, and they feel, leave you feeling empty. I'm using people because we understand people. We understand certain social behaviors of people. And sometimes when you're around certain people, there's such a negative energy. Always negative. And sometimes you wonder why I'm still around these people. Every time you get around them, they drag you into some fleshly arena that weakens your anointing. If you are among people and they know that you're a believer this morning and you stand for Christ and you're living for Christ and they're trying to pull you into an environment that is not healthy, even for your walk and your life, you've got to do something about it. Are you following me? The wrong people in your life can keep you from your destiny. Many of God's people, hear me now church, will miss their destiny because they allow the wrong people to access their lives. Let me put it across like this. Every preacher shouldn't have the right to speak into your life. That's tough. Now let me break it down. Just because... Someone called himself a prophet doesn't give him the right to speak into your life. 
Because every, every brother don't want you blessed. Hello, somebody. Let me say that again. Every brother doesn't want you blessed. David brothers in the scripture, when I read in the account of 1 Samuel, David brothers who criticized him for coming to the battlefront, they didn't want him there. What about Joseph's brothers? Joseph had a, a dream, but his brothers betray him and threw him in a pit and sold him into slavery. So not every brother, amen, desire to see you prosper. Not every brother, amen, desire to see you go forward in your life. We're going somewhere. Some of the greatest enemies in your life is closest to you. I'm not speaking in a sense literally to say the person sitting next to you is close. That's your enemy. But I want you to think for a moment this morning. Some of the greatest enemies are close to you. Or they're trying to get close to you. Example this morning, the Israelite allowed 10 of their fellow brethren to talk them out of their destiny. Read in the book of Numbers, the first wave, amen, to reach, amen, just before they go into the promised land, forfeited going into the promised land because 10 of their brethren tell them something negative and tell them we cannot take this land. There's giants in this land, are you hearing me? Why I'm saying that? Because it wasn't the devil. It wasn't even their enemies. It was their friends. The people they knew. Was telling them, hey, we can't take the land. But God said that land belonged to us this morning. Everybody in the church is not ready to press in and cross over their Jordan. And take possession of their promised land. Hear me now. Not everybody wants to go in a hike with God. There are many people who want to stay right where they are in, their spiritual, in spirituality. A little compromise here, it doesn't hurt nobody. I'm not doing anybody anything when I compromise my life. Really, you're doing yourself an injustice. Because the prepared place that God has for you, you can arrive there to enjoy the best that God has for you. Because when you live a compromised life, amen, I want you to hold back yourself from getting to the place that God wants you to be. Pastor, don't go there. See, we got to understand something. As I said, and, I, I, and God's Spirit dealt with me this from the, when I came back the Friday night. Because too many pulpits in this world, we are not getting the pure and unadulterated word. Because preachers are preaching. And yes, they're preaching the blessings, amen. They want you to be blessed, but they're not preaching for you to change your lifestyle. They're not preaching so that you can live the, the path and walk in the path that God wants you to walk. They're not preaching against sin. So they say, you can do whatever you want and it's quite all right. God is a loving God. God is a forgiving God. But they failed to tell you this morning that if you disobey God's word, judgment is going to come. Are you hearing me? You know in the book of Acts they tell you that the, those who was making a difference for the kingdom of God was considered as troublemakers. Hear me now, I'm the biggest troublemaker. Because as long as I'm going to live my life this morning, some may not like me, but I'm going to speak the truth. Are you hearing me this morning? And I'm going to preach what the word of God says. Are you hearing me? You just want to be a part of the work and not part of God. Are you hearing me? We're having a church today, churches preaching all around the globe, amen, about everybody wants to be blessed, but nobody wants to make a commitment to surrender their life to God. I hear they want the benefits that God can give, but they don't want to surrender their life to Him. You see, and those who will not cross over their Jordan will do their best to keep you from not going over either. Because if you hang around people who are not going anywhere, if they see you making progress in your life, they will want to pull you back. Because your progress is going to show them up. Hello, somebody. If you're making progress in your spiritual walk, and you have a friend who just decides to just be laid back, and they see you making progress, 
they don't like that. Maybe they start to envy you. Maybe they start to jealous you. But if they do what you do and commit to God, they will experience the benefits that God has for them just as well. Hello, somebody. So God told Abram, I'm going to bless you and make your name great and make of you a great nation. And that all the nations of earth will be blessed in him. Followed me this morning. Because what God didn't tell Abraham was what he was going to go through before the promise became experience. And many times God will give us the promise, but he don't show us what we have to go through. And so when we are going through, we wonder and we question if this is the right path that we are on. Hello, somebody. Because in order to reach a promised land, they had to go to a wilderness. They had to go through some different things within the wilderness. But God still had a plan for them. Some of, some of God's people today are going through things that are absolutely con contradictory to the promise that God has given to you. God has spoken to your eye, but past. Pastor, why am I experiencing all these negativities? Pastor, why things are not working out the way that God has promised for me? Pastor, why God is not doing the things that I prayed for and asked? I believe God. Why? And so the very walk that you're walking, it seems contradictory to what the promise of God. I found me this morning. And so you have a prophetic word. Prophecy that, 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 that you know that is from God. How many of you know that God... When God spoke to you and given your word for your life. But every natural evidence this morning says it's never going to happen. Have you been there? Because God gave you a word that all certain things are going to happen in your life. But everything else is not working in compliance with what God says. And so it's like it's contradictory. But I came to tell you this morning. I come to tell you to hold on, change is coming. Tell your neighbor, hold on, change is coming. Hold on, change is coming. The reason I'm saying that is because one of the greatest activities of faith is being able to wait on God. Are you hearing me? Let me say this again this morning. Because to be where I am today, I had to wait on God. I had ability, I had skills, are you hearing me? But I had to wait on God. Are you following me this morning? And that's why I come to recognize within my own walk with God that one of the greatest activities of faith is being able to wait on God. And you'll find humanity, even people within themselves, don't want to wait. We have a problem to wait. But Isaiah tells us in chapter 40, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings and eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. But those who wait on the Lord. Because God has a timing. You see, when you walk in with God and you are totally surrendered to God and God places you in a waiting mode, waiting mode is not denial. When God has you waiting, it's not He's saying that you, it's not going to happen. God is orchestrating things and putting things in place. Amen. So it is workable for you. Sometimes God had a place I said, I remember, this might be an out of context example. But I remember one night I was uh, doing a crusade in, in, in way down in Penal. Somewhere, I think in Scott Road, Penal. And we finished late. And everybody left me. And because I had the old van with all the equipment and everybody leave me. And I have to get back to Samoa. And it was about 1.30 in the morning, and I alone coming down that highway. And I want to do it because I sleep here. I want to reach home. So I'm driving a little fast. But when I reach somewhere, somewhere around Marabella, um, over the underpass, amen, I hear the Holy Spirit says to me, slow down. Was not a police car coming. Uh, the voice of the Lord said, slow down. And so I was obedient and I slow down and I just, just go. I said, God, you got to, if I had to pull aside and take a rest, I'll do that. But the Spirit of God says, slow down. It was about a minute after in distance. If I had kept the same pace that I was going, when the Holy Spirit spoke to me, I would have been in one major accident. Because about one minute 
ahead of me, there was a major collision where about three or four vehicles and people were on the, on the highway. People, cars were down in the, in the gutter. And I want you to know it's because God had me wait or delay for a moment because I would have been in that collision. Are you hearing me? So sometimes God said to you to wait. And that's why we got to understand this morning that the greatest activity of faith is being able to wait. To trust Him when you can't even trace Him. Are you hearing me? When all hell is breaking loose against you this morning, amen, to stand like Paul, the apostle, and say, Sir, I believe God that it shall be even as it was told to me. Are you hearing me? Numbers 23 and verse 19 said, God is not a man that he should lie, amen, and the son of man that he should repent, but had he said it, he shall do it. How many know that if God said it, he will do it for you? Had he spoken it, it shall he not make it good? He will this morning. Like it or not, you have been blessed to live with a question in the midst of change. I, we all will have questions when God is changing things for us this morning. But it's a blessing because you know why? we in transition. I was saying to our pastor just recently, and for those musicians or those who understand music this morning, I understand that this is what the fabric at times that God does for our life. So we're on the key of C and we are playing. But here it is, we want to take it up the higher key. We want to go to the key of D. So we just can't make, amen, just go from C straight into D. In musical terms, there got to be a transition and chord that you play play before you actually make the change. It helps us to make the change or make the switch. And sometimes that transition chord is a suspended chord. Chord. You neither know in C nor in D. Are you hearing me? And sometimes we feel that we're in that place because I know where I was in C, but I know that God called me to be in D. But where I'm at right now, I don't really know. Amen. Maybe I gotta change the church. Maybe I gotta go somewhere else. Are you hearing? Maybe I'm not hearing from God. But I want you to know this morning that when God is going to put you and bring you into transition. He will have you suspended. You need in C and you need in D. But I want you to know it's because of God is the one that will have you in transition. Are you hearing me? Because he's bringing you into the key that he wants you to be. Somebody say wait on the Lord. And so we see here, Abram is like many of us. He had trouble. Or he had some trouble obeying God. Well, put on a defense right now. Many Christians or many believers have a problem obeying God. At first glance, when we read through the scripture, it seems though Abram or Abram is perfect obedient servant because he did what God says to do. Leave his country, leave his kindred, leave his nation. Are you hearing me? So we see him as a perfect obedient servant, but he was only actually obedient. How many know what it is to be partially obedient? Let me say this to you. If you're partially obedient to what God is saying, you're disobedient. Hello, somebody. We tend to believe that we can live half of the word and, and, and bypass another half. I want you to know, if you can be completely obedient, if you're half obedient, you are living in disobedience. Followed me this morning. Abraham delayed his blessing because of partial obedience. Why is that? Pastor explained to me how he uh, delayed his blessing. Let me show you. Many times we have delayed the promise of God coming to pass in our life because we have only been partially obedient. My Bible tells me, amen, to obey is better than sacrifice. We're going somewhere. If you look at verse, verse 7 and 8, it says to us that Abraham is building an altar to God. Abraham is praying. Hear me now. There are many people who are partially obedient to what God is saying, and they're praying. Mind you, they could pray. But Abraham is building an altar, and he's praying, but yet still, he is disobedient. How can one be praying and still be disobedient? Because he's building an altar. Read verse 7 and 8, you would see. Abraham is building an altar to God. But yet still, the same Abraham or Abram building an altar, he was still 
not obeying what God says. Abraham is building an altar to God. Abraham is praying, but not obeying. Like many people today in the church, they were praying and hoping to get a word. Hear me now. People are praying to get a word to get us out of the word that God has already spoken to us. God already tell you what is going to happen. But you're praying that God give you a word to cancel the first word. Uh -huh. God changed that. God spoke to you. And he tell you. He show you. But now you're praying. You're fasting. You're trusting God. And you're praying God. Are you hearing me this morning? I'm going somewhere this morning. Or we are praying to try to get God to change his mind. Willing to pray, but not obey. That's deep this morning. It's a simple statement. Willing to pray, but not obey. You will be surprised. And I'll, I, you can take an inventory this morning. Because you can hear how people live or see and, and hear how they live their life. There are a lot of people can pray. They'll pray heaven down for you. They could pray, or they could bind, they could cast out demons. But to obey so, certain simple truths in God's word? No. Think about it this morning. Oh, I'm fire for God. I can pray down a storm. But certain things in God's word, you will not be obedient to it. The, the devil just sat back, stand up there. They're praying all their prayer. If you can't be obedient to God, you think that they're afraid of your prayer? Huh? If you could disobey God, he devil know you could pray. You know all the wide words to say. But if you're disobeying God, you think it have any effect against the enemy? I was saying last time to a brother. How many what I'd seen when, when the Dracula movie came out the first time? The episode on television, I remember as a little boy. And a Dracula, when they show you a, a movie with a Dracula, they will show you a priest or somebody have a wooden cross, and they will hold the wooden cross so, and the Dracula will dare not come near close to them. Have you ever seen that? In today's movie, I put a poster back across the Dracula, slap them, and move aside. He afraid that because it's not the matter of something symbol as a symbol. The Bible says the enemy knows who belongs to God. The enemy don't know who is faithful. You want to buy an enemy? Go ahead, buy an enemy. You think the enemy don't know who is God? The Bible says, when we read in the, in the, in the scripture, he says, I know Peter, I know Paul, I know all these guys. Well, who are you? Who are you? Because if you could pray and you can't obey what God's word says, you're fooling yourself. You're fooling yourself. Abraham knows that he, he is to separate himself from Lot. If God tell Abraham, and, and I'm bringing it down to a close. If, if God told Abraham to leave who? Leave his country, leave his kindred, and leave his family. Why is he taking Lot with him? Lot was his nephew. His brother had died. And maybe he felt some type of responsibility. Sometimes we are like that. That we bring people on our boat who is out of the will of God saying, hey, my boat is a love boat. I can help you. And all the resources in your life is helping them and they don't really care about the God that you serve. Uh-huh. It's true. Read that in, in the book of Job. In, in, in the book of Jonah. The people accommodate Jonah on their boat, but Jonah was out running away from the will of God. And a storm came as a result of Jonah being out of the will of God. And these people was going on their destiny, had to throw their cargo in order to save their life. Hello, somebody. We're going to leave that there. But what I'm saying to you this morning is that Abraham ought to separate himself from his family. But he took Lot. And you can read verse 13, chapter 13, and we'll see what, what transpired 
Amen. With, with Abraham and Lot. And we're getting into that before we close. So we know when God deals with an area of the self-life, we know the conviction of the Holy Spirit. How many know the Holy Spirit will convict you when you're going wrong? Is that so? But how many people, they hear the Holy Spirit speak to them, but they ain't listening. They put a deaf ear. Are you hearing me? Because the, what the Holy Spirit tells them to do is bring a conviction in their life. And they don't want to do that because they prefer to pray but not obey. Are you hearing me? God wants us to obey Him. Tell your neighbor, say neighbor, God wants you to obey. And so we see here this morning that Abram, he, he carried Lot with him when he's supposed to set, separate himself. But it, it's hard to get rid of something that is such a part of your life. How many know that this morning? When you get close to something, it's hard to get rid of it. That's why there are people today still struggling with certain things in their, war, in their life. If it was sin, hear me now, we're looking at Abraham's life. If it was sin, he would quickly oh, repent and obey God. We know that because we know that sin separates from God. And it will destroy our souls if we keep on doing the thing that is against his word. But Abraham was trying, he wasn't trying to cover up the sin. He was just holding on to flesh. Because this was his relatives. This was his nephew. But if God tells you, and I want you to see because there's a bigger picture in this. If God tells you to leave your family, leave your country, and your kindred, and leave the country while you're carrying Lot with you. Now, every one of us, that's why I said, we have a lot to get rid of in our lives. Each one of us have a lot to get rid of in our lives this morning. That's what Lot represent. Lot re represent. His nephew Lot represent in this episode a little bit of that which God said to leave. When God tells you to get rid of certain things completely, you still leave something behind. You still hold on to little things, you know, because you like it. What is your lot? Because everyone has a lot to get rid of. Think about what is your lot. It has some people's lot, you can see it clearly. Because God had tell you to give up that a long time, but you try, still try to hold on to it somewhere. Some places I see people go, they still hold on to a little lot. God tells you to get rid of it. Hmm? What is your lot that you're holding on to? Because certainly there's a lot in everybody's life that need to get rid of. We could be all spiritual, but the best of us have a lot to get rid of. Because there's somewhere in our life we hold on to something that God says completely get rid of. So, we pet it, we feed it, and if you pet it and you feed it, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to grow. Follow me. So Lot was, Lot was Abram's flesh connection to the old country. And this is important this morning. Lot was Abram's flesh connection to the old country. Someone to reminisce with, with him how great it was in the past. You know, like somebody, some of your boys, they, they meet up, and you're going good, you're serving the Lord, and so happen you meet the wrong crew, because this is the crew that you used to hang with, and all of a sudden, you're engaged in talking, boy, let me go somewhere and take something, little boy. And you try to defend yourself. I'm just making up something because it's true sometimes. Well, you know, I'm done with that, but you, you mean you're done with it? It's not going to harm you, one for the road, brother. You know, we come a long way. Hello, somebody. How many understand what I'm saying? Let's take one for the road, man. No, no, nobody hurt you. You're going to kill you, know, man. That could be for one person, but it could be a lot for something body else. Are you hearing me? So, so Lot, Lot was Ab Abram's flesh connection to the old country. And there is a lot in our life that's connected back us to the past. 
There's a lot in our life that connects us to the life that God said to get rid of. To our past life that God has delivered us from. There's a lot in all of us that we need to get rid of. It isn't so easy because when you get upset and somebody do you something or something happened in your life, sometimes the best of us, instead of we go to God, revert back to how it used to be in the past. Especially if you were a cuss Oh man, don't talk about that. Huh? Especially if you were a drinker. Some way inside the house, you, you pull it out. For different people, it's different things. But I'm saying that it is a connection with a lot of the life that God has delivered us from. Are you hearing me this morning? It's dangerous to run with people that always want to talk about how it used to be. Like our better days is not good. The better days were yesterday. Our present day is not good enough. You always have people tell you, you know, boy, how it used to be in back in the day. And they make you think that there was so much hope. But it was gone. That was in the back of the day. You're living in the present. And thank God for the life that you're living. Thank God for saving you. Thank God for delivering you this morning. Because if you had remained in the state that you were, that you were in, in the, from the past, amen, you would have been a messed up person by today. Maybe dead. Maybe your family destroyed this morning. And how much fun it used to be. How crazy you were. You know, there are all these people coming to remind you how good it used to be when you used to live in sin. You know, when you're going to the club and you used to bump and grind. They all remind you, you know, how good it used to be when you used to smoke the dope and all these things. There are people who are always coming into your life to remind you how it good it used to be in the past. You trying to serve the Lord. And it's happening even today, brother. Maybe I'm speaking a little different, but I, I want you to notice something. Sometimes it even happens in our present day because you could be serving the Lord and all of a sudden something happened and you're going back doing things that your God pulled you out from. Hello, somebody. Oh, it's not you. We, we, we got it made. We got it made. So Abram had locked with him. When Abram left his homeland, Lot was just a tag along. In other words, it was a small reminder of the old country. But soon, Lot has increased because if you pet it and if you feed it, it's going to increase. And the Bible says, amen, that Lot increased. As soon as Lot has increased in strength and number, there was strife between them. In other words, when the flesh had grown... The self-life increased until it was almost equal strength to the spirit man. What you feed or who you feed in your life is becoming stronger. And if you deny the spiritual man, the spiritual food, and you feed the carnal mind, and uh, the carnal man, the carnal food, then the carnal man is going to get stronger than the spiritual man. I, if you deny the carnal man, and you feed the spiritual man, your spiritual man will overcome the carnal mind. Are you hearing me this morning, somebody? But the Bible tells us a lot increase. You, you read and you see, lot increase in goods and in flocks, hurt men just as well. And the devil doesn't have to get you to sin to forfeit your destiny. Hear me now this morning. The devil doesn't have to have you sin in order for you to forfeit your destiny. All he has to do is to get you to let the flesh have the upper hand in your life. And we say the devil make you do it. It's not the devil make you do it. The devil can't make none of us do anything that we don't want to. So when you cuss out your neighbor, the devil will make you do that. When you do things against God's word, the devil will make you do that. It's because you reacted based on your feelings. You didn't respond to the word. And so we blame the devil. But the devil understands if you allow the flesh to have the upper hand in your life, and you will be defeated. Amen. You will uh, forfeit your destiny. Because it's because many people today, and I'm saying this with all the passion in my heart, many people are forfeiting their destiny because of the work of the flesh that is operating in their life. Are you hearing me? Because he knows that the carnal mind is enmity against God. 
and is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then that they that are after the flesh cannot please God. So if the enemy it continue to allow your flesh amen, to, to take charge, then he knows he's winning the game. He's winning the battle. What is one of the most things that the church is facing today? It's not the fight, it's not against really. Yes, we are fighting against the devil. But most of the time, it's not the devil, it's the flesh. It's your flesh. Because why? The flesh has to be crucified every day. Are you hearing me? If we don't crucify the flesh every day, everything is a problem. Our aunt's passing the ground is a problem. Everything is a problem. Because why? It is engaged in the flesh. God help us today. So then they are after the flesh cannot please God. Abraham delay obedience. His delay obe obedience has permitted his flesh, his self-life to reach a place where there is now a battle, a strife, and a contention. Why? Because the lot who we carry at the beginning that God says, leave behind, now is engaging you in confrontation. If you don't get rid of the lots in your life, and you pet it and you feed it, and it remind you how good it used to be, it will come a point in your life, amen, it will try to fight you. That's why many not in the church today, sorry to say. It's not about a pastor, it's about a church, it's not about the worship. All that will be going great. But people are struggling with the flesh because why? They have allowed the lot, amen, to stay in their life. When God said, get rid of the lot. What is your lot? You can never isolate the flesh in one little compartment and expect it to stay there. It's either the spirit will throw out the flesh or the flesh will overthrow the spirit. So there we see, finally, Abram recognized that they no longer dwell together. And I'm praying, God, let the people of God come to that place to recognize Lot and Abram cannot live together. We had to come into a place in our life that we got to understand that we can't walk this walk with God and still hold to the arm of flesh. Because Why? You making your, you're putting yourself in a place that feels so, so horrible within yourself. You got to make a decision right now in your life. If God is God, then serve God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Be the person that God wants you to be. Don't be a double standard with your, with your walk. I say to myself this morning, I come to a place in my life. When I make my decision for God, I say, God, if I'm going to serve you, I'm going to serve you all the way. Because I know what it is to party. I know what it is to social drink. I know it's to hang with the guys. I know it's a golf and club all night. I know. But the day I make a decision for God, I say, I'm going to serve you all the way. And that's the place that we got to come. Because a surrendered life is a committed life to Christ. I get much amen this morning. You can't have the, the both worlds. The only both worlds that you can have is the one that you live here and holding on to heaven. Are you hearing me? The things that God has for you in store. That's why we have designed the me metamorphosis of our life is that we are on the earth, but we can touch heaven. Are you hearing me? This is the life that God wants us to live. Listen, brothers and sisters, you cannot have two landlords. The Bible says you can't have two masters. You cannot serve two masters at the same time. Either the flesh will rule or the spirit will rule. Some living in life and being pulled in either direction. If, you, if God is God and serve Him, if you don't want to serve God and you want the world, then go ahead. God is not forcing nobody, are you hearing me, to serve Him. Are you hearing me this morning? God is not putting a gun to your head and say, serve me. No. I believe the goodness of God should bring us to a place. That we want to serve God with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our might this morning. Are you hearing me this morning? You think when God looked back as our father and he have done all these incredible things for us to bring us out of darkness and still see that it's taking you out of darkness and place you into the marvelous light but you keep creeping him back into darkness. You think the father enjoys seeing that? No. 
Abraham tells the Lord, it is time for us to separate. I got to get rid of you. We got to make up our mind. We got to get rid of Lot. Whichever way you choose to go, I am going the opposite way this morning. This is the declaration of Abraham. How many of you come to that place and say, I got to separate myself from Lot? We can't go in the same direction that Lot is going. If you're hanging around with people like Lot and they're pulling you away from God, it's time that you cut it off. You be the light, they follow you. You don't follow them. The road that leads to the destruction is broad and wide and many shall be on that road. And the road that leads to eternal life, this few, is going to be on that road. Here's your recognition that the flesh and the spirit is at war. Are you hearing me? You cannot tame the flesh. Hear me now. You cannot tame the flesh or train the flesh to be holy. The flesh must be crucified. Pastor, I can deal with it, you know, Pastor. I'm strong enough to deal with it. A friend of mine, he told me, yeah, I can handle a few drinks, yeah? I can handle it today. He's an alcoholic, not serving the Lord. You don't try to play and fight the enemy on your own strength, are you hearing me? God is calling you to be a separated people. Holy unto God, are you hearing me? We'll, a church like this would not be popular. I hear me. A church that is preaching the truth of God's word is not going to be popular. The church that is preaching a, a, a compromised gospel, people will flock to that because why? Amen. It will not bring them to a place to bring change in their life. It's a good spirit type mentality. So they come out, amen, you go and do whatever you want and then go back the next Sunday. But here it is, when you come to this ministry, I am determined to preach the unadulterated word of God that to tell you, you got to live a separated life. God brought me out of Hinduism and I'm not going back there. I say it plain. Are you hearing me? Some people tell me they talk about Hinduism and I can speak about it because you know what? I never used to eat meat for almost seven to eight years. I used to wear dhoti. I used to go to the temple and beat the hand drum and stuff like that. And you're telling me what God has delivered me from now. I'm going to go back in. God has put me in light. Why shall I go back in darkness? That's me. That's me. That's me. I'm not talking you. I'm talking me. And I could express about me this morning. Are you hearing me? But I understand that I can have a two landlord. Are you hearing me? If presently I have one landlord and if I go pay the next door landlord the money for the rent. Amen. It's not going to be a nice thing. Hello somebody. And we have two landlords in our life. We cannot have. We only got to have one. Are you here this morning? So immediately after the separation, God speak. Could you imagine? When you, Lot is, con, is in your life and has grown up in your life, you can't see what God is showing you. You can't hear God's voice. Listen to me this morning. You would see when you read in the passage. Let me read it. Genesis chapter 13 verse 14 and it says and the Lord said unto Abram Abram after that lot was separated after only after only after hear what he says he says God is saying after he made that decision lot we got to separate son you choose if you go that direction I'm going the next direction and it's only after that the Bible says hear what God says Abram, lift up now thy eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee I will give it and to thee thy seed forever. Verse 16, and I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth so that every man can number the dust of the earth, there shall, shall thy seed also be numbered. Notice that how he's able to see what God has prepared for him. It's because why he came to a position in his life. He says, I can have Lot hanging around me. Are you hearing me? And if we have a Lot attached to our life this morning, 
I want you to, you will not be able to see what God has in store for you. It's only when you get rid of the lots of in your life, then you'll be able to truly serve God and see what God has in store for you this morning. First Corinthians chapter 2 and 9, it says, But as it is written, eyes have not seen, neither have it entered into the hearts of men, or, or neither have ear have heard this morning the things which God has prepared for those that love Him this morning. Are you hearing me, church? The one thing you and I, we need to remember is that in spite of all the stuff that we have been through in our life, hear me now, no matter what we have been through in our life, you are the recipient of the blessings, amen, that cannot be reversed. You didn't get that this morning. I said, no matter what you go through in your life, if God has given you a promise, you are the recipient of the blessing and the promise of God that cannot be reversed. Because God says, who God bless, no man curse. Who God curse, no man bless this morning. So regardless of what I'm going through this morning in my life this morning, I am still a recipient of the blessing. Just like I showed the young people, if I have this $20 bill, it worked $20. But if I squash it up like this and I throw it in the ground and I step on it, you can still take this $20 and go in the store and it will still worth $20. So regardless of what you have been through in your life this morning, your value still remains because you are the recipient of the blessing of God that will not be reversed this morning. Are you hearing me? And so lot means covering up to wrap up closely or tightly. This means that the flesh will keep you from seeing and receiving what God has prepared for you. Only by the Spirit can you see and receive what belongs to you. Somebody today is standing on the verge of the break, greatest breakthrough of your life. And you're getting ready to step into the promise of God for your life. You're getting ready this morning to experience the destiny this morning that has been prophesied over your life. But there's one thing that will keep you from stepping in this morning. There's one little thing that can stand between you and your breakthrough. And that one little thing will rob you of your destiny if you let it. The little thing is called a lot. Are you hearing me? It will blind you. It will blind you to the inheritance that God has for you. And if you do not deal with it, it will rob you of your destiny. And that is a big trouble with a little lot in our lives this morning. Just as Abraham separated himself from Lot, we must separate ourselves from the self-life. Some of you can't go anywhere in your spiritual walk. Because one moment you, you're happy and you're walking with the Lord. And the next moment you, the Lord pulls you out somewhere where you shouldn't be. Hey, pastor may not see, but God sees. A lot of time we think the pastor not seeing. Oh, pastor, hey, it doesn't matter if I don't see. But what matters, he sees this morning. And you wonder why it is you're struggling. I want you to when Abraham, amen, allowed Lot in his life and took him, there was strife. There was contention. There was division. And that's why many people who choose to live this way with lots in their life will always experience the fight, the contention. Amen. All of these things because why? They're supposed to get rid of the lot. You ain't going to say nothing. Now listen, I have been called the worst in my life. But it doesn't matter. Are you hearing me? It doesn't matter. I could, I could live a double standard life as a pastor. Are you hearing me? I can live how I choose to live and live with lots in my life. But I want you to know I'm fooling myself. Because when I stand before God, I could tell God all the prophecy that I prophesy and all the healing and all of these things that I do. God, didn't I do that? Lord, didn't I pass the kingdom life ministry? Then I pray for people all over. Then I go and minister a word. God going to depart from me for I never knew you. Your lot could be your hindrance in your life. I remember one time I was in church. Coming to a close, but I remember one time I was in church. And we had a special engagement in the church. And they depended on me. Because at that time I played the guitar. And, and they depended on me. The team depended on me. Mr. Rennie. They depended on me. They didn't have no guitarists except me. And instead of being there, I went to a club. Make a light to the pastor. You know, we can do that very good. You look at me, yeah. 
this flesh. Lied to the pastor and I went to the club. I thought I was enjoying myself. But you see, you can be, be enjoying yourself and be in the world. And when you taste of God, when you taste of Jesus, there's no experience like tasting the Lord. I'm trying to tell you this morning is because I'm real. I know what it is to be there. And I let down my team. I let them down because they didn't have no guitarists. And we have practiced and rehearsed and I let them down. And I was dancing in the party and dancing and having a good time. And inside of me felt so ugly. So ugly. Because I allowed a lot to dictate my life. I was broken. I didn't feel like I ever wanted to go back in the church because I felt I failed everybody. I disappointed them. So I had come to a place in my life to understand that there is a lot in my life that I need to get rid of. And sometimes those lots that show up in your life by the things that God tells you to be obedient to and you're disobeying. And you're holding on to a lot. If you hold on to a lot, you will experience, amen. You will not experience the best that God has for you. Would you stand to your feet this morning? Tell your neighbor, say neighbor, it's time to get a lot out of your life. It's time to get a lot out of your life. Oh, Father, rose your name. Sing louder. Let this place erupt with praise. Can you hear it? Sound of heaven to the The sound of heaven touching the Just for a moment this morning, I just want to ask you the question, what is your lot? What it is your lot that always causes you to fall back in your walk with God? What is your lot? What is the thing that you're struggling with the most in your life? Because we all have a lot in our life that we need to get rid of. The love God, I, I wouldn't dispute that you don't love God. But there's a lot that you need to get rid of that God has spoken into your life. The lot that you have to bring and crucify the flesh so that it will not overrule you. Spirit of God. Can you can sing this song?
Draw me close to him. Today, I want everybody to understand this. I didn't preach down to you, but I let you know the struggles that we face. But I pray that your desire is just like mine to draw closer to God. That your life will be sold out to Him. And whatever He asks of you to do, that you will do it this morning. Don't let lot grow in your life. Put it under subjection. Crucify the flesh this morning. Will yourself this morning. Because Abram had to make that decision to tell Lot, Lot, you got to go. How many of you say, Lot, you got to go for my life? You got to go, Lot. You got to get rid of Lot in your life. Let's sing that song this morning. So draw me close to you. Hallelujah. I pray this morning that every person who stand here, even those who watch and by the internet, that we look into our own life today as believers. The appearance of the Lord can be sooner than we expected. You have been saved. You reached us far. As one songwriter declares and singer, you come too far to give up now. To go back in the things of the world. To be like a dog returning to its vomit. God has saved you and taken you out of darkness and placed you into your mother's light. Nobody and nothing is worth your salvation. Jesus Christ paid the price for you with his life. And he paid dearly for it. That you can live today. And as you live your life today, separate yourself from Lot. Live a life holy to the Lord. Obey God in everything. 
Because there's coming a day. There's going to come a day that we have to give an account for the life that we lived before God. Don't let the lots in our life hinder you from your destiny. Get rid of those lots this morning in your life. As you hold these emblems in your hand this morning, the Lord Jesus in the same night before he was betrayed, he broke bread and he gave thanks and said, This, take ye, this is my body which is broken for you. And in the same manner, he says, after supper, he took the cup and he says, This is the new covenant in my blood. He goes on to say that as often as you eat the bread and you drink of the cup, you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes. But it tells us this morning, don't partake of Holy Communion unworthily. For this reason, if we take it unworthily, many sleep, many are sick among us. This morning, what it is to take it unworthily is that we allow the lots to rule in our life this morning. And this morning, I want you this morning to just bow your head this morning and you know where you are. I'm not, I'm not here just trying to motivate you. This is your walk with God. This is between you and God, the one who paid a price and died for you. You know what you're struggling with. You know all the things that you have done or doing. Search your heart. David, that's why David was a man after God owns head. David recognized something. He said, search me, O God, and O my heart, to see if there be any wicked ways in me. He said, forgive me according to the multitude of your tender mercy, blood of my transgression, pardon my iniquity, forgive my sin. Because he said, I recognize that I've sinned and sinned against you only. He says, if you could only wash me with his sub, I shall be clean. The hidden paths, the outer path, wash me thoroughly. But there is still something greater than the hyssop. At that day, we have the blood of Jesus that was shed. As Isaiah writes and declares, Though with sin be a scarlet blood, it shall be made whiter than snow. This morning, search your heart this morning, beloved, this morning. I don't know why God would have me up till uh, almost three this morning, just focusing on this. The let the church, sometimes I feel like every Sunday I should hit a home run sermon. But why would God will have me to say this? Because there's a struggle within the body of Christ. And God is calling people to be holy, to be separate. God wants you to come into that place that has been prepared for you. And don't let the lot hold you back from getting to that place. So with every head bow, and every eye closes between you and God this morning, God, help us all this morning. We are nobody without you, God. God, while enjoy this sin for moments, pleasure, and lose, oh God, Father, to spend a Christless eternity without you. God, help us all. Oh God, help us this morning. Spirit of the living God, as you bow your head this morning, just for a moment, there's a prayer of David that says, Spirit of the Lord, fall fresh on me. Now I give the minister, minister when he can just sit in that rest. As a prayer unto God this morning, this is between you and God. I don't know why God pressing me. I feel his spirit tongue in my spirit. I couldn't sleep. It's not because I wasn't sleepy, but because the spirit is drawing some stuff into my heart this morning. And I want you this morning to bow your hands. God has saved you, called you this morning. Now is the time to just get with him this morning. Spirit of the living God, living God. 
Let him breathe this morning. Let him breathe. Oh, let, let him, him breathe. breathe. Everyone this morning. Oh. Take of the bread this morning. It's all a glass this morning. We thank you, God. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, God, for coming and dying for us, wrapping yourself up in flesh to pay the ultimate price, to be the sacrifice, to redeem us, oh God, and to restore us back, oh God, into our rightful place as family this morning. God, I declare this morning. 
Father, that Lord, all the benefits of Holy Communion will be added unto us today. In Jesus' name. Let's partake this morning. And if you can this morning, you could rest your glass on the chair. To God be the glory. And I want you to give God the best praise just before we leave this morning. Come on, if you know it, to God. To God. To God be the glory. Be the glory. To, to God. Be the glory. For the things he, he has done. With his blood. Come on with all your might and all his strength. Come everybody, just lift your hands this morning. To the creator of everything. To God. To God. Be the glory. To God. Be the glory. For the peace. Has done with his blood, he has saved me, and with his power, he has raised me to God. Be the glory for the thing. Come on, clap your hands, holy people, and shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. Before we make our way out, I just want to say to all the leaders, all the workers, every one of you this morning, the teachers to the back, the ushers, every one of you, I want to say to you that I love you. And I cannot do this work without you. I thank God for you and for your family. And for the input that you're making because it's significant. Because all that you're doing is to please the Father and into His kingdom. And I want you to know as long as God will have me to be your pastor. I want you to know I will love you. I will pray for you. I will lift you up. As I said, sometimes I feel that every Sunday shall be a, a home run message sometimes the way that god operates and works is because he sees where you where we are each one of us and the way how we choose to minister is because that's the way he has planned so that he can reach your life this morning don't let no lot take permanent resident in your in your life get rid of the lot so that you can see all that god has for you are you with me this morning I want you to hug your brother, hug your sister, leave from this place, amen, with the presence of God.